So we've been trickling in, right? We had outdoor service, and then the last couple of weeks, some people were here while we were doing the uh, online live stream at 11.30. So it just gets more and more normalized, more and more like really back home together. I know the first couple times I saw Unity people, it was like, you're in 3D, <laughs> you know? instead of the Zoom screen, right? <laughs> but really it's 4D, isn't it? Because we're always in the fourth dimension, uh, Unity, right? <laughs> There's a little bit of both going on. So I saw one of our beloved folks the other day just happened to bump into Jeff Cushing, who is one of our um, folks that, that has been devoted to our youth program for many years. He's our handyman here at Unity, he helps Charlene with all kinds of things in our facilities. And um, I didn't know about Jeff that he's a Rosicrucian and he was called back into, um, he's part of the Rosicrucian Order AMORC, if you're familiar with it, and he's called back in to initiate some of the newbies. So I'm fascinated with these groups that have um, known times of sort of having got, had to go underground and, and be secret societies. And he was saying how similar unity beliefs are to the Rosicrucians. And I, I found some information about how the Fillmores, our co-founders, were influenced by so many different groups, um, but Rosicrucians were one of them. And so that was interesting. And then, being 4th of July, uh, he was, Jeff was mentioning, well, George Washington was a Rosicrucian and Ben Franklin was a Rosicrucian, a couple of forefathers. And then I found out that Abra Abraham Lincoln was a Rosicrucian. So uh, I'm saying all this because I realized that on this 4th of July, and so many of our ideals as, a, as America, as a country, are also shared in unity by what we believe and what we live in our philosophy. There is definitely an overlap, right, or, or a complete harmony, really, with the ideas that are expressed in the Declaration of Independence that was signed this day in 1776, that we all believe in equality of, of pursuit of happiness, of life and liberty for all. So thinking about how we, we all hold these things, and some of you may be coming into unity or new thought or, or other sort of not quite as mainstream as maybe something you grew up with, maybe have, have had some influence um, against you of, of feeling like, oh, I have to be kind of quiet or close, have to keep this close to my heart, can't tell mom and dad about it or Uncle Joe or whoever it is. So you can relate to some of the, the um, the beauty of these uh, ideals and visions that we hold, and yet at the same time, not always having full spiritual freedom and religious freedom to express. And so today, I wanna really celebrate that, our religious and spiritual freedom, to really walk our paths as we wish to walk them, to believe what it is that we believe, and, and to be grateful for the, the freedoms that we have in this way. So thank God for these freedoms, right? Thank God, goddess, the universe, great spirit, Allah, all the names. We honor the many paths to God and the many names for this benevolent being that, is, that animates us and that surrounds us and protects us and guides us. So all of this feels like a celebration today. There's so much to celebrate and freedom being this, this key part of it. We're not totally out of the woods of the pandemic, but it sure feels like we're getting freer as we go. And so there's celebration around that as well. So I've been thinking about, you've been listening to me for 15 months, week after week. And I thought, you know, I want to know what's going on in our community, what's been happening for other people and what their spiritual journeys are all about. And so I thought today you might like to hear from some voices in our community. Our talk title today is American Spiritual Journeys, Voices from Our Community. So I've asked two very special people to share with us today, Alexandra Diavolon and Dimitri Doronkin. Um, they, are, they have a lot in common, actually. They, neither of them were born in America, so they came here as immigrants. Their first language was something other than English, so they have a, a different native tongue and have since learned English, of course. 
And they also are deeply spiritual people. They both are very committed and conscious beings on this spiritual journey. They're also very devoted to unity, to our community. And so that shows up in a lot of ways. And they're going to talk a little bit about uh, their service and their contributions to unity. And also, they are both board members. Alexandra serves as our vice president of the board, and Dimitri is longtime board member. Yeah, so you can give them a hand if you want. <laughs> so I am first going to invite um, Alexandra to share her story, and then that will be followed by Dimitri's. Oh, I think you might want this. I didn't need the mic, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in El Salvador, Centro America. My ancestry is Mayan and Spanish. And my mother was the pioneer that brought the whole family here. She bought the house. She invited sisters and cousins and everybody came to our house and then she found them a job and this country provided freedom for all my family and friends Spanish is my first language my grandmother taught me to pray in Spanish and I still pray in that way it comes naturally. Growing up in San Francisco was incredible, but more than that, I got exposed to yoga and meditation by George Harrison. <laughs> I was 12 years old, and it was amazing to me because I grew up in a family where there was always festivities, excitement because people were always landing at our house for a year or two and always something going on. So when I heard George talk about being calm, breathing, and the zitar, it was another world for me, and it gave me the opposite of what I was experiencing. Then, as divine um, guidance gave me the miracle, on KTVU Channel 2, a yogi was teaching yoga and meditation. Excited, I put out my towel. My grandmother was watching and she said, teach me. So I translated it all from English to Spanish. Fast forward a little bit, I work for Google and that is what I do. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so there I am teaching my grandmother yoga, meditation. And the world is expanding. And so many journeys. One day, early 1970s, I worked for Pac Bell, AT&T, and I went to my favorite bookstore, and I found this little book. What Are You? by Imelda Shanklin fascinated. It has been with me for over 40 years. I've read it many, many times. It still speaks to me. But what was interesting in the back, it talked about unity. So in those days, there was no Google. I went to white pages, yellow pages, found it. And there it was in 19th Avenue. I started going. I started inviting my family to come. And the one that really liked unity was my dad. And he would get dressed up real dapper in a suit. We'd sit there, and then we'd go out to brunch. It spoke to both our hearts, and we had that one thing in common, he and I. As time progresses, the deepening 
of spirituality continues. The Rosicrucians, as Reverend Kristen mentioned, I became a member of the Rosicrucians and was for many, many years. And there's the affinity again, spirit talking to me. Then an adventure took me to Egypt. And there I lived for two years. One of the most sacred things that I experienced was the call to prayer. In Cairo, busy, noises, honking of horns, the call to prayer and everything stops. And people look at Mecca, the direction of Mecca, and they stop to pray. Whether you're in your car, outside walking, people kneeling, and then the call was, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The sound fills your soul. How sacred that everyone is saying it together. It is so beautiful. The richness of living in Egypt and all that I learned there was preparing me for another wave coming into my life. And the wave was the transition of my son. He was six years old. Thank you, God, for spirit and understanding the teachings, the teachings of unity, of the Rosicrucians. And what it gave me was the need to reconnect, so I came back to unity. And the support that I got, I was understood here. Years later, I have a divorce. And again, my community shows up for me with love, understanding, so much kindness. And I look at our values. The value of love. I experience love from everyone here in this community. I experience connectiveness with everyone here, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's at Trader Joe's. I connect with all of you. Being of service, I learned that here at Unity. I really didn't know what that meant, but being of service, and I look at so many of you that we do service with each other and it makes it joyful when we work together and take care of each other and take care of our beloved home here at unity and then we have wisdom spiritual wisdom that we practice it we look into each other's eyes and we know that we are going to do this together. We're going to spiritually hold hands and walk this path and practice forgiveness and understanding, compassion. This is what I've experienced here at Unity. I'll leave you with this. In Spanish, when a mother gives birth, we say, dar luz, to give light. And this is what Unity has given me, light, luz. Namaste. Good morning. My spiritual journey starts, started around 30 years ago, right after I finished college. I started feeling something different. I started feeling something beyond physical world. I got this really weird feeling that something else exists, something we cannot really touch or see. And that's how I started looking for God. And where you go when you're looking for God? You go to church. <laughs> and the one church was available for me at that time was Russian Orthodox Church. I vividly remember that first, my first visit, 
big doors, you come in, it's pretty dark inside. The windows covered with colored, colored glass, sunlight barely goes through. Candles, a lot of candles. People standing here and there, holding, holding their own candles, crossing themselves, bow down. Icons on the right, icons on the left. Huge golden iconostasis in front. And here he was, the god. <laughs> the biggest icon with the picture of old man. I got really impressed. But he was looking at me really strong. <laughs> he was holding his hand like this and just asking me, what are you messing about right there? <laughs> so I was right here, and he was all the way up there. Someone advised me to start reading Bible. OK, I'll try. I'll try. Ten Commandments, favorite place. And that's what I read. You shall not make for yourself an idol in form of anything in the heavens above, in the earth below, and in the water beneath. So I came back and said, listen, hey, have you read your book? <laughs> so I got really discouraged. I got really disconnected. I left. Well, that time, I met my wife, have a kid, have a new life, have a new job. Really forget about all these things. Spirituality, who needs this? But then we came to America. And when I'm thinking right now, when remembering that time, first my, five, five, my first five years in America, it reminds me of the story. The old man died, went to heaven, met God. And God opened up the long scroll in front of him. And on this scroll, the man can see all his life from the beginning to the end. And also he can see two pair of footprints. One was this man footprint, another was God footprints. And only in one life, in only in one time of this man's life, he can see only one pair of footprints. So he cried out, how could you? How could you abandon me in my hardest time of my life? And God said, I never did. I carry you in my hand. That's how I felt my five years in America. Now, I want to tell you up front, I'm not saying that God was carrying me on, on his hands. That would be ridiculous. I'm just too heavy. But I really start feeling the presence of divine around me. That year was really broke this distance that I'm here and the God is up there and above. No. I start feeling something really divine next to me, walking with me, feeling my pain, feeling my love, and helping me on the way. Little by little, our life here has get better. I opened my first company, got my license. We bought a house, fancy cars. Oh, I thought, this is it. I made it. This is American dream. This is all about, right? And then a few years later, poof, everything was gone. We lost the house. All possession was gone. Empty bank account. In 2010, we've been one step to being homeless. And that's the time I was like, where's the God? What is this? What is going on? Why am I feeling alone? That was a time when I felt not just the God next to me, but actually inside my heart. This is what I really grow spiritually. You feel this presence, absolutely fantastic love. Few, few, few years later, uh, my wife showed me the video on the Facebook, Lisa Nichols put on. 
It was speech of uh, Reverend David. And I don't remember what, this about, what was this about, but um, we really love it. And we say, hey, listen, this really weird place right there, and it's close by. So the next week, we just show up here. And David did some speech about Jesus. I don't remember what it was about. So something about Jesus. And then he stopped himself. He said, I want to make a comment. This is not what Jesus said. This is what Bible said Jesus said. And I turned to my wife, and I almost cried. I said, this is my church. This is our church. <laughs> so that's how everything starts here for us. And the way I see spirituality now, I see two different approaches with people. One is the approach I call it passive, passive approach, or help me please approach. And you can really reflect, it's in a, let's say, conservative tradition, when somebody comes into the church, buying the candle, light the candle, putting it in front of the saint, make a prayer, and leave. Or you can actually see it in our church. Sometimes people come in late, listen to the message, leave early, drop something at the prayer box. That doesn't work. I mean, I try it, never works. I'm assuming it doesn't work for anybody else. <laughs> and then another approach is the call I call active approach. And that's how I call it, may I serve you approach. Or how can I serve you approach. And that's involved two spiritual principles. One is a tithing. Another one, we kind of talk as a giving, but I'm just saying, no, I don't really like the word giving. Giving, receiving, it's like a bargain. No, it's a serving. When you serve, you really put yourself in the hands of someone. You do what needs to be done. Right after we joined, I started taking classes. One of the classes was prosperity class with David. And I thought, what is this about? Prosperity, spirituality, prosperity? And of course, first evening, tithing. And I said, this BS again? <laughs> Jesus. But see, you cannot say this to David. I mean, you just respect the man. You don't want to make a fuss. And just, so you go with the flow. <laughs> and I thought to myself, OK, well, this is, will go for eight, eight weeks. I can make it. We can go through eight weeks, right? But it's really make a difference for me. Interesting that my wife was going with me on this class as well. And she stopped doing the tithing for, for that time. And we have actually, three years ago, we have a conversation about it. And she told me, oh, it's working for you because you're believing in it. So it's working for you. And I said, listen, this has nothing to do with beliefs. This is just a principle. It's the same on the physical level. If you go and stand against the wall and bang your head against the wall, you feel the pain. That's the same thing with this. It's no difference. So I make a deal with her. I said, listen, I'm going to stop tithing. And I am booked right now for, uh, this was uh, three years ago, August. And I said, I'm booked right now for Four months up front, I'll stop tithing. I will be still be collecting my everyday money, just putting in the box, and see what happens. Two and a half months later, I came to her. I said, "Remember our conversation?" She said, "Yeah, I remember." Well, I said the finish, the work we're doing right now almost done. The next project got canceled. No calls. So basically, I have a one-week work. And she was looking at me like. OK, what, what, what we're going to do next? And I said, OK, watch it. Watch this. So I got the money I collect for two and a half months. I brought it to Charlene. John was there. He was freaked out. It was around $2,700. I, go, I said, John, just chill. Don't worry about it. It's just my tidying for the next two, last two months. Not a big deal. So, and then I just continue my tithing, as I usually do. It doesn't matter. You make $500, you put 50. Make 1,000, put 100. Really simple math. Yes, it is. 
In three weeks, I was booked again, four months up front. Wow. It's, I'm telling you, it's like that. Don't have to be worried about it. Like I said, for example, oh, best advertising ever. Yeah. It's just like not even do anything much. But this is not enough, believe it or not. You have to do the second part, and the second spiritual part is serve. You have to serve the divine. I'm really thinking this is a very special place. When I said the divine presence is here now, I really mean it. I really personally believe in it. I actually want to make a joke about it. That, so the Holy Spirit dwells belong you. Beyond. <laughs> no, it's, but it's just. So when you come here, all you need to do is to really ask yourself, what is mine here to do? And just go with the flow. See how you can unfold your love, your care for this community. And so the way, the way I live now is you can describe with, this, describe with this song. Row, row, row your boat <laughs> gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Namaste. Thank you both so very much. Sorry, I lost my microphone. Thank you very much, <laughs> both of you. Such, such a blessing and an inspiration. And if you know these two, which you probably do if you've been around for a while, um, they have really seen us through lots of times at Unity, but especially through our reopening uh, processes. Dimitri's been here every single Sunday at the outdoor service doing whatever. I said, do you really enjoy running the sound? He said, no, but there's a need. <laughs> and Alexandra has helped us very much with that as well. And so many other things, too many to name, but your, your beautiful stories. And I know we only got a little nugget of each story. Now, of course, that always opens us to want to know more, right? And to want to know more of each other's stories. Part of our freedom, part of this, this uh, freedom of the spirit and our religious freedom is to both honor our own expressions and our journeys and also each other's, to bear witness to each other's journeys, you know, and to even maybe sometimes practice other people's practices. So it was really beautiful when you were talking about Egypt and, and really beholding that uh, Muslim call to prayer and, and, and just acknowledging how it affected you as well, Alexandra. So. Um, so anyway, we are, we are free and unlimited and hallelujah that we can practice and be who we are and, and realize our divine potential as a community. So let's close out together knowing these aspects of, of our journey and celebrating our spiritual freedom together. So together, I celebrate spiritual freedom by honoring everyone's journey and expressing the fullness of mine. And so it is. Thanks again to our speakers. <laughs>